Hello and welcome to the All Bases Covered podcast with me, Rob Smith. My guest this episode is Matthew Russell, a successful businessman and distillery owner who's based in Kent. His latest project has been the creation of the Copper Rivet Distillery in Chatham from scratch in a former dockyard building, the amazing Pump House No. 5, which is an extraordinary bit of Victorian architecture, sat right next to the River Medway, where they make gin, whiskey and vodka using all locally sourced ingredients. But Matthew has a really interesting backstory. He was academically awful at school, he couldn't read when he was 11. He failed his English GCSE four times before he was eventually diagnosed as being dyslexic when he was 18. Well then, after a spell sheep wrangling in Australia and then several years in the police, he started work alongside his dad, Bob Russell, in building up Beams International, a firm that makes all sorts of bespoke packaging, mainly for food and drinks manufacturers, from Heinz to Guinness to Lanson and Glenfiddich. He's a really engaging and entertaining chap who's living proof that there's no one right way of building a successful career or business. One very little warning, this is a grown-up conversation and there is a moment where the F-bomb is dropped, but it's in the context of an amusing story about an Australian sheep farmer, so, you know. We recorded the conversation in early December of 2020, before the Tier 4 regulations were brought in, the usual social distancing protocols were followed. If you hear the odd noise in the background, that's because we recorded at the distillery and there are people busily packaging and getting ready for the Christmas rush, but I don't think it's enough to spoil your enjoyment. I plunged straight in and asked Matthew how they've been coping with the weirdness of 2020. It's been a very weird year, yeah. Um, I think in some respects, when we look back uh, here at the distillery, we're one of those industries that's fortunate because we had something that was required, which was uh, alcohol, mm -hmm. uh, um, and we were able to switch into hand sanitizer, which we mainly supply to the police yeah. services. Um, so that enabled us to keep the plant going and keep everyone. Because people probably don't realise quite what a distillery does, because you've got a slightly unique setup here, haven't you? Very unique. Yeah. yeah. Very. So you actually make your base spirit here, which most other I don't know, you know, gin manufacturers, whatever, wouldn't do. They'd buy it in from somewhere else, but you can actually make it from scratch. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Copper Rivet Distillery with Dockyard Gin and uh, Bella Vodka and Mast House Whiskey now. Um, we set out at the very beginning to do everything from scratch, to have mm. control over every element. And of course, the base alcohol that's required for spirits uh, starts from a base material we use grain mm -hmm. um, and that means a brewing process to get uh, a low alcohol mm -hmm. um, and then a distillation process or a, a series of distillation processes in order to get to the high alcohol content that's required and you actually produce gym. what 95 percent pure alcohol that you can you can produce it uh, a little bit higher 96 and a half 96 and a half 96 and a half that's quite percent. strong yeah, that's uh, that's pretty strong. Yeah. So under the under the current rules with Europe, in order to make vodka or gin, you need to start with a base of what's called neutral alcohol. Yeah. And that's ninety six percent as a minimum uh, alcohol base. And as right. you quite rightly say, the vast majority, ninety ninety five percent of the gin distilleries around, will buy in that from uh, industrial plants. When COVID struck. Um, a lot of those industrial plants were in France, Eastern, Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. um, obviously they stopped uh, exporting that. So there was a, a big shortage of, of, of neutral alcohol. Yeah. To make sanitizer, you need a similar neutral alcohol uh, base. And we're one of the few places that can actually, actually produce that. that. And you mentioned the police, the fact that you, you got in very early on with, I think with the Met and with Kent Police to offer them the option of, of buying you know, really good quality hand sanitizer. Yep. But you've got a, a sort of a personal interest in that, haven't you? Yeah, I, I have. Yeah, I was in the police when I was younger, um, and uh, my sister was in the police. Uh, my brother-in-law uh, has just retired from the police. So, uh -huh. so yeah, we have um, we have some connections or sympathies with with the police services, especially in these times when, you know, just like doctors and nurses. Uh, and, the, and the fire brigade, you know, mm -hmm. they, they are on the front line, but um, often don't get the, the publicity that maybe the NHS does. 
So let's talk a little bit then about how a copper ends up running in brewery. <laughs> <laughs> so it might sound like you know a sort of a dream move, really, but we're, we're, let's go all the way back to when you were younger. Yeah. So, at school, what were you like at school? Were I enjoyed academic? school. Did you? I did enjoy school, uh, but not for any of the lessons. Right. <laughs> just, 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 just for the the friends that you make uh, and and the experiences you have. Um, let's let's say that. But you weren't an academic. I was not an academic, no. No, I failed my 11 plus uh, dismally. In fact, I remember one, one morning arriving at St. Margaret's School in Raynham. Um, and uh, I can't remember who it was, but obviously one of my friends said, oh yeah, it's the test today. You, you know, we've got a big test. Mm -hmm. okay. What test? Uh, and he said, oh, you know, the test where we work out what school we're going to go to next. Obviously, that was the 11 plus. Yeah. Um, and I was blissfully unaware of that. I said, oh, that's fine, then I'll, I'll sit next to you. Oh, no, no, it's not, one of the, it's not like the normal tests. And normally I would sit next to a couple of people and copy them. <laughs> uh, but, but to my disgust, uh, they'd set the room out, so there was no, no ability to... You could lean over. <laughs> exactly, lean over yeah. and copy. So clearly that test didn't go my way. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I failed dismally, so... Um, I, uh, well, my parents decided that, that, that I needed to go to a different school, uh, which was uh, King's in, in Rochester. Right. I was really fortunate that, that you know, they, they, they scrimped and saved and managed to get me there. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, that was a bit of an eye-opener because I'd gone from a school where I could play the game and, and get results to a school where, and at this point I couldn't, couldn't read. Um, How old were you? Well, at 11 I couldn't read. And you couldn't read? No, no. I, I, used to, I used to go to these friends. We had a thing called KMP, the Kent Maths Project, mm -hmm. uh, which was little cards and it had a picture of, say, ice hockey. Mm -hmm. um, and then it had a little story about ice hockey. Mm -hmm. And on the back you'd have the questions. Um, and you were allowed to ask the teachers about the questions. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to play the same trick, but obviously on different people, mm -hmm. I'd rotate, mm -hmm. um, and, and um, obviously work out what the picture was about, mm -hmm. and then go to a friend and say, hey Rob, have you, have you read this card yet? It's mm -hmm. all about ice hockey, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, no, 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 no. I said, well, just read that bit. Mm -hmm. No, 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 read it aloud. Mm -hmm. So effectively, the, the so other kids would other read. to read out loud to you. Yeah, and then I'd go to the teacher and say, I don't understand question one, what does it mean? And then I'd answer the question. Um, that way. So when you say you couldn't read, we, is this dyslexia that we're talking about, or, or the, you know, what, what was yeah, the issue? It, yeah, it turns out that, yeah, I was um, dyslexic, mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't picked up until I was 18, so. So you managed to bluff and fake your way through school? Pretty much, no, I've done it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing though, isn't it? Because yeah. it does require you to become incredibly inventive and find, find different ways around solutions. Yeah, there's always solutions to everything, I yeah. think. Um, and uh, you know, I truly believe that. It's, it's not a problem that can't be solved. It's just how you solve it, I guess. Mm. Um, but you know, when I went to the senior school, from not being able to read English, all of a sudden I was dumped in an English lesson, a French letter, uh, lesson, and, and a Latin lesson. And I thought, oh my God, what the heck? Yeah, how am I going to deal with this? But um, How did you deal with it? Uh, it was a struggle. Yeah, mm. the first year or two was a real struggle. Um, but Do you find reading a problem now? I don't read. I've, 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 I've never read a book. Um, well, there's one book that I did read on holiday, uh, uh -huh. which was Bravo Two Zero. Oh right, yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, it's a military daring do. Yeah, and I don't think uh, it's probably the best literary piece uh, that's ever been written. But but um, it's something that I could persevere with, you know, over a, over a couple of months and, yeah. and get through. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I don't read. Um, uh, but in hobby. business terms, because obviously there's a lot of information that you've got to take in and think about and assimilate. So do, yeah. do you find figures okay? You can sort of process that? Figures or? are fine, not a problem. And, and, and funnily enough, from a business point of view, I, I, I sometimes th wonder whether my dyslexia helps me read contracts and things. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, 
contract to most people is quite boring, mm -hmm. but you're not following a story. Mm -hmm. um, you're sort of reading pertinent points. And the way that my mind works is that it will literally read a sentence or a paragraph at a time yeah. and absorb that information and then move on to the next one. And you kind of forget what was in the previous one. Mm -hmm. So it's quite easy to sort of skim through contracts and then focus on the pertinent points and then switch back to where that relates to. Right, okay. Um, but other people, I guess, who normally read stories, trying to read the way through, find it quite boring and monotonous. Whereas and trying to make sense of the law is often a, <laughs> a fool's errand anyway, isn't it? You have to take it for what it is and be literal about it. And, and I guess that's what helps me. I'm not trying yeah. to read anything into it. I just read the literal words yeah, and, yeah. and it kind of does make sense to me in a funny kind of way. So you get to 18. Mm -hmm. um, did you get any qualifications? Yeah, I, I managed to get, I think, uh, five or six, five GCSEs, uh -huh. which got me into doing the A-levels. Uh -huh. And then I got one A-level uh -huh. uh, in craft design and technology. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, there you go. The other so, two so weren't so you, successful. So how did you make the, the step then into the police? What was the point there where you thought, I, was it literally, I need to do something, what am I going to do? Well, it was kind of. Um, all the way through my um, school, I was going to join the military. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I got dead set on. Uh, had lots of selection courses and, you know, I'd, I'd pass them from a, you know, Physical, physical point of view and a practical point of view. Um, but um, I, I was trying to get in as, a, as an officer. Um, and whilst I'd been offered places, it was all contingent on me getting an English GCSE, right. um, which I didn't pass. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd taken it four times at that point and mm -hmm. still hadn't passed, which was when I think then they picked up, well, maybe this guy's dyslexic. Yeah. Um, that must have been, I mean, emotionally, a really tough thing to go through. Do you find it difficult talking about it? Yeah, a little bit. Um, because, I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not a great one for sympathy. I think, you know, you, there, there are other people that have greater hardships um, that deserve sympathy. I think that it's just one of those things in life, isn't mm. it? That, mm. um, you know, it, it's something that I would have loved to have done. Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't able to because of a, a bit of bureaucracy, which I guess still lingers slightly. So yeah. bureaucracy isn't something that I'm a big fan of. No. Uh, for that reason, probably. Um, but yeah, having passed, uh, pa uh, finished my A levels, I um, was still dead set on joining the military, um, but clearly wasn't going to university. Mm -hmm. um, clearly wasn't going into um, into the military at that point. So I. I went to Australia um, and lived and worked in Australia for a year. Right. Um, in a school, um, doing lots of outward bound and sports education with the kids. Okay. Um, operated as a sort of a junior housemaster for these um, Aussie kids. Um, Wh which bit of Australia were you in then? I was based in Southport, which is just behind the Gold Coast in Queensland. Oh, okay. Right. Um, which was great. It's an amazing place. Isn't Ama Australia? Absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, I did a lot of travels during the holidays, um, was fortunate enough to get invited by one of the parents um, who had a big um, sheep station mm -hmm. um, out in the middle of Queensland, uh, which I think it was like two days on a coach to get there, um, and then another four hours in a, in a truck to get to the station. It's one of those bizarre things, so I did a, I had six months in Australia when I was a similar sort of age, 18, 19. You just get used to the idea of the fact that if you want to go somewhere, it's going to take four or five hours. Yeah. You don't even think about it. Don't in the UK, that. if it takes more than 20 minutes, you're like, oh, come on, how long is this going to take? Australians, it's like, yeah. no, yeah, we'll get there tomorrow, it'll be fine. Yeah, so that, I mean, that was phenomenal. I, I got out there for the shearing season and, and uh, helped with the shearing. Oh, she, well, I didn't really do that much shearing. I did a, one or two sheep, but the guys that do it professionally obviously go, start in the north. Yeah. They work all the way through the country and end up in the south. Yeah. Um, and, and they knock out, um, you know, knock this out uh, like nobody's thousands business. Thousands and thousands. Of them, yeah. yeah. So you can sheep wrangle them, can you? So, yeah. Th well, they didn't have horses, which was fortunate. They had motorbikes. Right. Uh, to round the sheep up. And um, yeah, we used to go out early in the morning with the, with the bikes, um, go and round them up and bring them in. And the reason they had bikes was because... Uh, Bill Chandler was the, the, the guy that owned the farm. 
And I asked him one day, because they had the stables and the paddocks, and I said, mm -hmm. well, why no horses? Can I swear? Can I swear on this podcast? Yeah, go on then. <laughs> and he said, ah, fucking horses, mate. You know, the trouble is, when they throw you off, they keep fucking running. Bikes, at least when they throw you off, they're only going to be 20 or 30 metres away. Um, so I thought, yeah, that's a valid point. Yeah, and and it did sense. throw me off a few times. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was fortunate I wasn't left in the middle of nowhere with a horse that's still cantering off. No. But, yeah, amazing. So it's proper boys' own stuff, though. A great, ah, great experience. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, and actually, it was in Australia when, when I decided that probably the military wasn't for me. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously here in the UK, we rightfully look up to the, the military. Um, but we look at you know those great battles in the past and everyone's a hero. Mm -hmm. um, in Australia, when I was speaking to some of the older guys there, um, they kind of have a very different perspective of, mm. of the military, I guess, because whenever they've been pulled into a conflict, they've often been put in maybe the, 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 the they get the rough end of the stick. Yeah. You think of Gallipoli in the past and you know they got roped into Vietnam, um, by the Americans, et cetera, et cetera. So they kind of see the military as being, yeah, it's a career and sure, there's great respect for the guys, but why the hell would you want to put yourself in that situation? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was at that point when I realized, well, actually, yeah, it's kind of crazy that, you know, I keep getting all these offers and keep passing all these tests, but because I can't write a nice enough letter with few enough spelling mistakes, mm. I can't charge up a mountain and get shot at which dawned on me as being slightly bizarre. Yeah. So then I was in that position, as you said, well, what do I do when I came home? Mm. Um, and I took myself to Mid Kent College mm -hmm. initially. Um, it was around about September time, so all the, all the other guys that were starting were already there. They were on yeah. sort of their induction days. And I walked in and I said, okay, well, which courses give a full grant? Um, that was my first priority uh -huh. um, and there were two one which was design and one which was business and finance yeah um, and it just so happened that the business and finance team were there that day sort of having their induction so I walked across and had a chat with them and said this is what I've got uh, you know I'd quite like to do your course as long as I can get a full grant and they said yeah, that's fine it's amazing how sometimes massive decisions are made in such a glib way. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. those things where, where the, if the circumstances hadn't been exactly like that at that point, your decision process could have been completely different as to what you did. You might have done the design course rather than the, the yeah. business one. Yeah. That everything would have followed on from it in a different way. But at the point when you made that decision, it was kind of like, oh, well, yeah, I'll do that then. It was an element of chance, yeah, very much mm. so. Um, the guys were there and we had the conversation that seemed that I could get on the course and start in a week's time and get a full grant. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, uh, Dad had a couple of off-licenses, so I'd work in the off-licenses over the weekend. Uh -huh. um, and some of the evenings, I picked up a, a little gardening job over in um, Merriworth. Yeah. So on my little 100cc Honda, uh -huh. um, I'd go over there and do, do a, a morning's gardening. Um, so you, what, this is like 18, 19? This was when I was, yeah, 18, 19. Mm -hmm. um, and I had more money then, I think, than... Disposable income. Disposable yeah. income, yeah. Well, I look back on it. I mean, obviously, the world was a different place, you know, when I, I'm a couple of years older than you. But you could go out on a Friday with a fiver and actually have a good time. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and if I had 20 quid, I was, I was... Rolling in it. Rolling in cash. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was great times, um, really good time. Um, you know, the course itself was only two years, but during that two years, as I say, full grant, bought myself a first set of golf clubs. Um, <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. uh, obviously the, the little motorbike um, was earning money from all sorts of different jobs. So you've always been a, um, what's the word? I mean, it, it, it's sort of entrepreneurial, isn't it? But it's kind of like, I want the money, how do I get it? Because I want to I wanna have fun. So if I want to have the fun, I need the money, where do I get that from? It's, it's a very direct yeah, process. I think, you know, from a family point of view, dad, dad has always worked really hard. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I guess I was the middle child. And this isn't a middle child syndrome thing. 
but I guess for you know a mum at home, um, actually running running part of the business, doing the books, mm -hmm. but but being at home, getting the dinners ready and stuff, um, having having me running around causing problems at home was always an issue. Uh -huh. um, so I used to during holidays um, get loaded into the van to go and do the collections from London. Were you one of those kids you. with too much energy? Quite possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Quite possibly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I used to go and help dad do collections from, at the time we were bringing in beer from France. Um, uh, we'd go up to London and, 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 and work, you know, buy from the cash and carries. Mm -hmm. and so it seemed like four in the morning. It probably yeah. wasn't. It was probably six in the morning or something. You'd be setting off and I'd be the, I'd be the little, I suppose a bit like a chimney sweep, you know, I'd be stuffed in the top when the van is full and there's only sort of a foot left. You'll be fine. Like, get oh, there. We can get more at the back. Just push the boxes to the back. Um, and yeah, I, I, I used to earn a bit of pocket money doing that. Um, and, and I suppose it sort of started from there really. Um, so you then ended up in the, in the police. How long were you in the police for? I was in the police for three years, mm -hmm. um, but the reason I ended up in the police was financial, mm -hmm. again. Uh, having finished my HND, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm. Um, and as I say, my sister was in the police. Uh, they just had a big recruitment freeze mm. because they changed the rules over living allowances. And, so and when are we pieces. talking, this is at what, late 90s? Yeah, 92, no, oh, early, early 90s, 90s yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Nine, uh, yeah, 90, 92, 93. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking, well, what can I do that is a decent wage? And at, you know, 19, 20, getting a job that was gonna pay 2021, mm -hmm. it's quite good. Yeah, um, and so they, look, they looked at your CV, they could see that you could wrestle a sheep, so <laughs> send them down Rochester High Street on a Friday night, you can sort them out. Exactly, something like that, yeah. Um, I, I guess again, I, you know, I, I suppose the practical side of me comes out, so you know, mm -hmm. at that time there was still quite a lot of assessment centres mm -hmm. for the policing. Um, and I put in my application and went for the assessment days. And again, it was a fortuitous thing. I just put on there unemployed. Mm -hmm. um, and I got a call from application to starting was only about three months right. for me because they'd just started the new wave of entries after this long So it's period. just lucky timing. Yeah, and one of the guys that was, uh, most everybody on the course that I was on had basically applied and been accepted a year and a half before and they'd been waiting. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I, I was the odd one out right. in as much as I'd put my name down but put down unemployed and someone had dropped out of the course. So mm -hmm. they obviously went through the list and who's immediately available, who can turn up on Monday. And I got a call, can, mm -hmm. you, can, you, know, can you start on Monday? Like, yeah, I don't see why not. And I turned up and, and there I was. So did you enjoy your policing experience? You only did three years. Some people, they get in the police and they stay in as a lifer. You obviously decided to bail out. Yeah, uh, that was possibly the hardest decision, actually leaving. Mm. I thoroughly enjoyed my time. Um, you know, I had some, I had some great colleagues that I worked with. Um, you know, there, there are ups and downs in, in that world, mm. um, but great, camaraderie mm -hmm. um, and the ability to, to, to make a difference um, which yeah I really I really did enjoy mm -hmm. and of course you could drive around and hoon around on blue lights and you know who wouldn't want to do that in their indeed, mid 20s indeed. And, and occasionally get out and roll around on the floor with somebody and you know play cops and, and you, you didn't you didn't mind all the the physical side of it you're quite happy getting no, stuck no. in yeah yeah, yeah, it was, uh, yeah it's yeah. good fun yeah, a yeah. Dreamy look came it, it was there. yeah, no, it was good fun. <laughs> uh, and 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 the section that I worked with, I I I, I was working in Maidstone, um, so it was Maidstone and Malling at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but the section that I was working with, you know, they were referred to, or we were referred to as a, a pack of wolves, um, in, in a in a good way. In yeah. as much as um, if there was a situation where potentially it was going to get a bit spicy, um, most of the crew would head that way mm -hmm. in case there was you know a need for some backup mm. and we'd kind of work really well together as a team 
Um, so I really enjoyed it. Yeah. But at that point, you know, a lot of my friends had gone through university. Stephen was at university, my younger brother, um, and you know, drugs were were rife. Um, and I didn't really agree with drugs. Right. Um, so I wanted to get more into into that side of policing. Um, and I was used, uh, used is the wrong word actually. Um, occasionally I'd be in plain clothes and do mm -hmm. certain things mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to go down that route. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there was a, not a waiting list particularly, but there was, there was always a barrier as to why someone that's only done three years could move on into into the more serious side of police. Right, right? okay. Um, and I think it, you know, the, the, the expression dead man shoes sort of pops into mind. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't the sort, I'm never the sort of guy that would say, yeah, yeah okay, I'll, I'll hang around. Because, mm -hmm. I, and I was told, oh, yeah, actually, you, you know, you, 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 you're the, I was called Rob in the police. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my name is Robert Matthew. So when I turned up straight away, the badges were Robert mm -hmm. Russell. And I thought, that's not a bad thing, actually. If I hear Robert or Rob, mm -hmm. I know I've got to behave. Mm -hmm. And if I hear Matt, I know I'm out with my friends from the rugby club <laughs> and, I, and I can behave a different way. So I, I had a split personality at that time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I very much wanted to get on and do, do the right thing. But I was told quite often that, um, yeah, no, 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 you know, you're the, you're the right guy, but... Um, you just got to wait for just, Yeah, just wait. You know, you know you, you've got 30 years in this job. You don't have to rush into these sorts of things. And for me, I was thinking, well, no, not really. I You're not, not willing to wait. So at the point when you decided you were going to leave, did you know what you wanted to do? No, I had no idea, um, again. Um, but it was a happy coincidence, I guess, that mm. at that time, um, my dad was just starting another business with a chap called William. Mm -hmm. um, and they needed two young guys mm -hmm. to, uh, with energy to become the sales guys to right. run around the country. Um, and I was speaking to my dad and saying, you know, what, what, what do I do here? I'm really frustrated with the police. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether to stay in or do something else. So he said, well, why don't you go out with William, you know, and spend some time out on the road and see what... what as a salesman. Uh, yeah, what it's like as a salesman. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I used to do night shifts and then go off and meet up with William and then go out and do the sales thing during mm -hmm. the day. Um, and that business is still part of the family concern, isn't it? Being yeah. You, you make all sorts of clever packaging stuff for <laughs> all sorts of products, all the, all the promo stuff. Yeah, Beams is oh, 24, 24, 25 years now. Mm -hmm. um, and exactly, we, we, we put together the gift packs for a lot of the supermarkets that you'll see at Christmas time. So mm -hmm. that might be a Bailey's and a, and a glass, um, you know, in a box or, or Glenfiddich and, 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 and a range of different whiskies mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a package. But it's not sale. all alcohol, is it? There's, there's a whole bunch of No, stuff. We do, we've diversified. We do some food elements um, and some more fun sort of mugs and, and, and bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we basically design and develop them and mm -hmm. then sell them to the to the to the larger retailers. So that was your your dad's baby. Uh, so it was even with uh, Will and, and Dad, and at the time, uh, obviously nepotism. I, I don't believe in nepotism, mm -hmm. um, and so I was pretty adamant that, and and so was Dad actually. He said, "Well, it's not going to be my decision. It's down to Will. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go out with Will and, and he thinks that you know you can you, actually do you can job. do it, then." Mm -hmm then it's, it's Will's call. Mm -hmm. um, and so William, another chap who was a year older than me, Richard, and, and myself, really started Beams. Mm -hmm. um, Dad was behind the scenes um, at that point. Um, and it's evolved from that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a journey. Mm -hmm. um, learned an awful lot. But I think the police really helped, actually. Right. Because in sales, you know, when you're, when you're meeting the big, especially as a, as a, as a young guy, when you're meeting a, a big buyer at Tesco's or, or, or Asda, it can be quite intimidating. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, being able to reflect back and saying, I've been in some more intimidating tight spots than this. Mm -hmm. We're only talking about whether you want to buy it or not. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of helped quite a bit and, yeah. and set some level of reality into that process. So yeah, I got on with it quite well. It's really interesting that, that because obviously you're 
you haven't got a, a classic CV, have you? You no. haven't. You haven't. You know, been academically good at school, mm. gone to university, done a kind of management program, any of those no. things. Having gone all around the houses and done all sorts of bits and pieces, which which are some of it was just circumstantial, some of it was was you know pure accident that you end up doing it. Yeah. But that's ended up making you have a whole like a toolkit of things that that you couldn't buy those experiences you couldn't you couldn't make a program that would would uh you would offer to somebody and say right i'll take you on in five years time <laughs> once you've done x y and z including three years in the police yeah i think i think you're right it's 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 life experiences but also i suppose um seeing lots of um characters that you you, you kind of with hindsight, look up to, but at the time, look at and, and observe and think well, that's quite a clever way of doing something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in, in the police, that my police sergeant Chris Kemsley, um, you know, at the time, he initially he was quite intimidating, very mm -hmm. old school, mm -hmm. um, but you soon realise that the way in which he managed his team, um, it appeared like it was with a you know rod of fear. Mm -hmm. Um, but actually it was really coercive and, and um, um, everybody respected him mm -hmm. because he just had a, a simple line in the sand which mm -hmm. was you know what was right and what was wrong mm -hmm. um, and he didn't appreciate when people did things wrong yeah um, so you know there'd be a bit so of a, a hair dryer should. moment yeah um, but actually he'd really appreciate and praise and, and and coerce people to do things the right ways and you look back at, at managers like that, and mm -hmm. you can you can sort of draw some 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 learnings, um, mm -hmm. which hopefully you can then sort of deploy in your own way. Yeah. Um, but you're right. You, there's no toolkit. I don't think that you know. I certainly turned up with. I've just sort of gathered bits of experience as you and, go along. That toolkit element that we're talking about. Now you're an employer. When you're taking someone on. Given the experiences that you had growing up and how you've got into yeah. the business that you had, do you, you you don't just look at the the obvious stuff on the CV? Are you kind of a bit, you know, do you, do you take a chance on people when you employ them, or how how does that work? Does that Some, inform your decision making? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I mean, from a personal point of view, it, it, you know, I, I identified, and 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 again, thank, thanks to Dad, that there were elements within my toolkit which were missing. Mm -hmm. So I did go on and do an MBA um, uh, later on. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to the point about when I'm looking at individuals to work within the business, yeah, I'm not looking at the classical kind of qualifications. It's mm -hmm. more the individual and their potential, I suppose, you're mm -hmm. trying to um, see. And um, I, I, there are still some people that work with us today that have worked for many years that I've, I've personally interviewed. Um, and if you ask them, they'll say, oh yeah, that interview was horrendous. Um, it was the worst interview I've ever had. Um, because in interview, I will ask really random questions. Uh -huh. um, so if I'm looking for somebody that's gonna be more of a project manager or a creative or a sales individual, um, you know, clearly they need to be able to visualize things in their minds. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they need to be eloquent enough to explain them mm -hmm. to, to, to other people. Mm -hmm. So I'll drop in the odd question, which will start with a very open question, such as, okay, if money is no object, can you explain to me what your perfect house will look like? Right, okay. Um, and for me, it kind of gives an indication potentially if, if they're a sales guy, you know, if they've got ambition, if money is important, they're money driven, if they want this massive house. Um, if there's somebody that's um, more working in the office, you know, w w what size is, 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 is relevant mm -hmm. to the house, but mm -hmm. it's more, I'm looking for how they can walk me through the house, so that'll be the next question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so take me through the house and describe it to me as if you're so selling it. If money were no object, what would your perfect house be like? Um, <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a good one, uh, Rob, and I, I think I'm fortunate in as much as I've I think I'm, I'm there. You've got it, have you? Yeah, um, for me it's the outside. Uh -huh. So it's having uh, a nice garden um, and a bit of land that I can go out with a chainsaw and uh, some tools and, and just spend the weekend 
doing boys stuff. Excellent. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm there chopping down the trees, prepping firewood, um, having a bonfire. Uh -huh. um, and of course, inside it needs to be cozy and warm for the family. So, um, but yeah, so yeah, I, I, in, in interview, I ask those random sort of questions no, to try and determine it, who the character good. is. Because, uh, I mean, if, if someone, you know, somebody listening to this, if they uh, have kids who are dyslexic or have problems at school or are disruptive, all those kind of things, they might well take some heart from what you're saying about, you know, the journey that you've been on. They'll be able to look at their kids and go, well, look, you know, th there are other routes. It doesn't, just because yeah. school and academia doesn't suit you doesn't mean your life is going to turn out crap. You can really make something of yourself. You've just got to follow that path. Yeah, I, d I don't think, I mean, I don't get, don't take this the wrong way, please, but, mm. I, you know, I, th I think, you know, the classic, you've got to be a doctor, you've got to be a lawyer, you've got to be a solicitor, you've got to be a, a journalist. All of that requires that university sort of education mm -hmm. and qualification mm -hmm. and then, you know, and obviously all the hard work that ensues. And, 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 and it's all, you know, um, merit to those that, that go down that route. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you look at successful individuals, you know, how do you measure success? Mm -hmm. Monetary wise and, and through happiness um, and, and home life. And if you do something that you're good at and you enjoy, mm -hmm. that's got to be a massive tick rather than just pursuing something because that pays the bills. I mean, that must be an awful way of life. Um, but equally, if you're good at things and you've got the right determination, and if you're dyslexic or if you've got you know other uh, other other issues, which you know minor autism or, or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. that make you look at the world in a different way, there's a real potential that you can do the right thing mm -hmm. in a good way, mm -hmm. but from a different way that hasn't been done before and be successful. Yeah. Yeah, um, different ways of viewing the world. So this building that we're in right now, pump yeah. room number five down pump room at number five. Chatham Dockyard. Um, so I was lucky enough to come in and see this place with you five or six years ago yeah. when it was literally an empty shell. Yep. Um, I mean, it took some proper vision to see what you could potentially do in here, but it's an amazing space, isn't it? That's beautiful. I mean, we're really lucky again. You know, I'd, I'd say it's a happy coincidence that we found it. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose that along with that goes sort of a bit of determination and, and, and not but wanting it's to give up. Was it empty for a good, what, 15 years, something like I think, that? I think it might have been 20. Really? Yeah, almost 20 years it was empty. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we, we spotted it um, and thought, wow, what a... It's kind of like a chateau in France, you know, it's... Such a beautiful building. It's like a sort of brick cathedral, industrial brick cathedral. cathedral, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, it it was going to be the it is the perfect home for for for, for Copper River, mm. um, and it enables people to come. It gives us a space to have tours and and and, and host people, uh, people to enjoy the outside space when COVID's not around. Yeah. Um, you know, have a drink oh, and enjoy the river views. Are you a drinker? Do you, do you like to have a drink? I, yeah, I, 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 I like to have a drink. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm probably more of a beer guy. Mm -hmm. um, well, you mentioned rugby. Yeah, yeah, I love rugby. That, that, yeah, I do love rugby. Um, but yeah, Guinness and if the rugby's on, lager if, 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 if the rugby's not on. Uh -huh. uh, I like my wines. Uh, when I did my MBA, it was in wine and spirits, um, and that really opened my my you know uh, my awareness of, of good quality wines, um, and of course I, I love spirits. Um, <laughs> Little tipple. Yeah, no, the spirits I, I really like because it's kind of a it's a merger it, within beers, wines, and spirits, which is the sector that we operate in. Mm -hmm. Beer really, um, from a business point of view, is all about logistics. Mm -hmm. You know, it's big volumes of liquid that you're shifting. So you do the brewing and okay, you can put some lovely flavors and hops in there, but commercially to make a, a good success out of it, you've got to go to scale and therefore you're talking tankers, you're talking barrels, collection of barrels from the breweries. And it's a really a logistics business. Mm -hmm. um, 
wine is beautiful. Um, you know, it's kind of very agricultural. Um, you know, getting the wines trained in the right way, the right grapes, the right soil type, um, the the right cuttings of the vines, depending on mm. where you are and how mm -hmm. much sunlight you're getting, and the seasonality. Um, and then you go into the manufacture mm. and, and the marketing side, but but that's much more agricultural. And I think spirits is that kind of lovely bit in the middle. All right. Um, you kind of have the ability to play with the liquid like you do with wine to, and beer to develop the flavors. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have the, the volume of scale that you do in brewery. Mm -hmm. So it's not all about logistics. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, if you go to the extent that we have where you're really interested in the ingredients, you get a little bit of that kind of, um, uh, uh, the element of the farm coming in where you're yeah. looking at how the how the Well, I think grow. the other thing that I've always found interesting about this as a business is that, that you've taken a really sort of two big decisions. One is to go for the highest quality that you can on everything, and the other is to keep it as local as you possibly can as well. Yep. So are those um, purely business decisions because of the market that you're looking to go into, or is that kind of a more of a, a personal crusade, if you like, that you're oh. wanting to, to do something locally and put things back in? Or is it a bit of both? I think, I think it would depend on who you, who you ask, what, what view they'd have, actually. Um, but, it, but it's actually a bit of both. Mm. Um, the reality is that when we were looking at um, starting the distillery as a, as a family, um, already operating for 20 years in this industry, um, you know, I was, I was quite fortunate in having insights in, in other brands. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized that we would, we would never have the marketing money or power um, to promote a brand um, as successfully as, let's say for example, Sipsmiths. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those guys are phenomenal marketeers mm -hmm. um, and produce a liquid, which is a good quality liquid, mm -hmm. um, but in such a creative marketing way that people just fall in love with it. Mm -hmm. um, Hendrix is another one, but mm -hmm. Hendrix is backed by a massive company, William Grant's. Mm -hmm. So again, the marketing spend that they can put behind creating that quirky um, brand yeah, pretty, is, yeah. is, is huge. So are you what they would call a disruptor then in this market? Yeah, yeah. so, so w that's definitely the channel that we decided to go down the disruption channel. Mm -hmm. and, and in early conversations, um, one of the proposals that we had for our kind of brand proposition uh, and you know the whole ethos was much more of a punk IPA right. and, and, and put two fingers up to the industry. Mm -hmm. um, we decided that we probably wouldn't be that brave mm -hmm. um, and, and actually be that disruptive, mm -hmm. um, but certainly disruptive in as much as um, we'll bring complete transparency to what we're doing and hopefully then people will ask the right questions about how other spirits are made, mm -hmm. um, because not all spirits are, are equal, um, and, and some are just an illusion. Um, and, and so we felt that if we had the best quality mm -hmm. and the most transparency, that enables us to open the doors with those in the industry that know, mm -hmm. and, and whilst there's 10 people knocking on the door, the one that they want to speak to is the the, the honest the broker. Quality. So you're you're genuinely proud of the stuff you do, aren't you? It, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, we are. Um, it's 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 not easy. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be easier to to operate as other distilleries do. Mm -hmm. um, it, other cr let's call them craft distilleries mm -hmm. do, um, and it's more expensive doing it the way that we do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but we also decided that we wanted a business to, that would have some longevity mm -hmm. um, and you know would have to grow more organically, but it would do that through consumers deciding that, uh, that actually yeah this is the, this is a this is a beautiful product yeah, and, and something good. that will be that's there good. for the long term so just before we we'll, we'll start rounding up in a moment, but a couple of sort of like big topics that I just wanted yep. to get into quickly brexit's the first one here we go oh there's a face <laughs> here we go what do you make of it what, what are you expecting to happen over the next six months ah uh, i 
you know, I'm an optimist, mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of numbers that get banded around by various sides in the argument. Um, at the end of the day, uh, Europe is our closest market, and we are one of Europe's closest markets. Mm -hmm. So it's illogical for either side not to want to work but together. But is Brexit about logic at all? Brexit whether it is or whether it isn't, what will happen in the next six months has to be based on the realities of the situation. Mm -hmm. um, now, you could argue that clearly Europe are making it as difficult for us to leave as possible because they have a club and they don't want other members of the club just turning up one day and saying, yeah, I'd like out. Mm -hmm. um, so they have to make it difficult to exit. Um, for whatever reason, we're where we are, um, there are going to be issues with labour shortages, for example, for beams, mm -hmm. because we, we, you know, we employ as many people as we can on a temporary basis mm -hmm. in, in Ely. We get up to 100 and 150 people in, um, and those guys are seasonal workers that might be working on the farms through the summer. Because one of your plants is up in uh, Cambridgeshire. In, yeah, in Ely, in Cambridgeshire. Yeah. Um, that's where all the gifts are actually put together mm -hmm. by hand. So mm -hmm. we need a, a big labour force for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of concern that that labour force won't be available because mm -hmm. of, of Brexit. Um, so what do you think that's going to mean? If you haven't got sort of an available labour force coming over from Europe to do seasonal work, yep. is that going to drive up uh, wages and business costs all the way around the houses because you're going to have to pay more to get people in locally and that's going to therefore just put inflationary pressures on products for everybody. Yeah, I guess the headline thought maybe from the government is actually, um, yes, that will drive up minimum labour costs, mm -hmm. which will attract more indigenous um, individuals to mm -hmm. fulfil those roles. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's more of a headline. Um, realistically, we're looking at dispersing some of our operations to mm -hmm. other parts of the country. So the northeast, um, for example, uh, maybe into Wales mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of spreading that risk slightly. Um, the optimist and the pragmatist within me says, actually, there's a lot of individuals that come to the UK to earn money and send that money back to Europe. Mm -hmm. Um, is it that the British government are using that as another negotiation lever mm. because those individuals then would be in Europe without work and be a burden on Europe? So will there be a permit scheme right, that then okay. comes so to there's fruition? There's a lot of bluff and counter bluff. Could be a lot of bluff because, and counter bluff yeah. because you know, the farms, uh, manufacturing companies, warehousing companies need the labour force. Um, it's not like we're running at 10% unemployment at no, the moment. No. Um, and Europe need those individuals employed. Yeah. So it, again, it doesn't make any sense to just put a complete So you're, it. you said you're an optimist. In business terms, over the course of the next year, are you reasonably confident you're in a good place? Whatever happens with Brexit. I think it goes back to what we were saying at the beginning. There's always a solution. Um, that solution may not be ideal mm -hmm. uh, in the short term, um, but y there will be a way. And I suppose the, the, the way to be lucky and find the right solution mm -hmm. is to explore all the options mm -hmm. and start to work with almost as many as you can. So, but people don't like change, do they? People never like change, whatever it is. No. And it's always difficult and it requires creativity as you say and brain power you can't just do that commute yeah. to work do the same thing that you've always done you've got to actually think about it again but actually yeah so once so you've gone through that process in a year's time you look back at it and you go oh, it wasn't, wasn't as bad as I thought yeah, so you know I, I was having a conversation with the board at beams uh, just last week and saying okay so what's going to be the impact if the impact on salaries is going to be a 10 percent increase um, on, on on the cost of labor mm -hmm. um, and if you imagine we've got a packing bench with 10 people on it, mm -hmm. you know, one person opening the box, the next person putting in a bottle, the next person putting a glass in. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got 10 people on that line and our cost of labour has gone up 10%, why can't we just mechanise 10% of it? And even if that is 
at the very end of the line where someone's taping the box up, mm -hmm. if there's an automatic taper, then we've reduced our line cost by 10%, which offsets the increase. Mm -hmm. That's one option. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that there are no. the machines but that can be deployed. But all businesses are going to be going through that. So it's, it's going to be a lot of churn then, isn't it? Whichever it's, way you look at it, there's going to yeah, be an awful lot of changes. There, there will be a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, some businesses will will be less affected than others. Some businesses will be able to react mm -hmm. better than others. Um, but next year, honestly, I think is almost going to be a harder year for people running businesses mm -hmm. than, 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 than COVID. Yeah, okay. So this brings me on to my, my last kind of question. Deceptively simple one, it's not. What are you doing for Christmas? <laughs> um, well, uh, at the distillery, we've got a lovely new uh, restaurant uh -huh. um, called The Pump Room, uh, which we've been unable to open because of COVID. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we've got a fantastic head chef who's done some videos and put them out, mm -hmm. and a great pastry chef. Mm -hmm. um, so I think he's going to be cooking my Christmas lunch <laughs> for me. Uh, <laughs> Um, or certainly doing all the it's prep It's so work. complicated, just trying to work out who you can see, when you can see them, whether you should be seeing anyone at yeah. all. Um, and I think that, I think the, you know, the government are, are kind of trying to row back on the three households thing mm -hmm. at the moment, but clearly don't want to upset too many people. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you know, maybe they should be a bit stronger mm -hmm. in saying, actually, you know, I think Wales has, has, or Scotland have certainly said, no, it's one night minimum if mm -hmm. you absolutely have to, and let's drop it to two households. So they've been a bit stronger. I think that the UK government could be stronger in doing that. Mm. Um, but no, we're going to be we're going to be at home, um, home alone. But home alone for us is is you know we're, again we're fortunate. Um, you know, myself, my wife, and three daughters plus the dog. So it's not really that lonely. There's no, always something be going, stuff on. going on. Well, uh, have a fantastic Christmas, Matthew. And you. And uh, I'm glad you're confident for next year. If you're confident, that gives me confidence that, you know, all is not lost. We'll get through Brexit, we'll get through COVID. The we'll world never stops time. turning, does it? And, and, and the sun always rises. So, you know, there's always a way. The sun always rises. The sun always rises. Good stuff. Matthew, thank you. No problem. Thank you very much. That was Matthew Russell of the Copper Rivet Distillery in Chatham. I hope you enjoyed our conversation as much as I did. If you'd like to get in touch, you can always go to the website wildrovermedia.com and use the contact page there. That's about it for 2020. Let's hope that 2021 is a much more positive year and that the words COVID-19 and Brexit both rapidly become things that we talk about in the past tense rather than being stuck in this seemingly never-ending Groundhog Day. Don't get me wrong, I love where I live and we've worked really hard to make our home a, a lovely, beautiful, comfortable place to be. But by the same token, I really need to get away for a few days somewhere. I'm sure you do too. Fingers crossed. Anyway, I wish you health, wealth and happiness for 2021. Or at the very least, the opportunity to meet up with your nearest and dearest without having to wear a mask. All the best. <laughs>